to see our smiling faces this morning. The Lord is good to us. I remember as a kid playing superhero with my brother. And back then you had to make your own toys. We couldn't go down to the convenience store or any kind of store for that and buy toys. So we had to make our own toys. We had to make, uh, we had to fashion bow and arrows out of twigs and yarn. But he also, I liked Superman and my brother, he liked Spider-Man. And so we had to fashion our own toys. And so I remember as a, as a child taking a pillowcase and putting it around my neck and tucking it down to my t-shirt. And I had like a, a, a makeshift cape. Well, that same pillow that I took that pillowcase off was, I'd put that pillow in the chair, and we would, I would lay on it like I was flying through the air. We had to make up our own, uh, our own toys and imaginations that, that a child has at that age. And, and looking at my own sons, I see that imagination sometimes come forward and, and come out in, in the way they, they play. Now, they, didn't have to, they don't have to fashion their toys like, like we did. But it's still the same thing, imagination, an act of imagination. And I would think to myself, looking back, that if, if we had getting, had enough time, my brother and myself would have probably jumped out the window if we could, thinking that we were some type of superhero. One time in particular, when we had moved into our first home, and I remember I was in the backyard doing some work, and one of my sons, I'm not going to tell you which one it was, you can interrogate him after, <laughs> One of my boys took it upon himself to put on a mask of his favorite superhero and go out in the front yard. Well, my neighbor comes over and says, you know what? Your boy's out in the front yard and he's got a, he's got a mask on and nothing but his underwear. <laughs> and I said, what? And I'll go out in the front. And, I, I, and, I, and there he was, sure enough, in his underwear, being, a, being Wolverine out there in the front yard. He had a mask on. And I remember taking that mask and, and looking at the inscription, and, and it said, not for protection. It said, parents, please exercise caution for play only. Imagine if, if the cape come with a warning. It would say, the cape, this cape does not enable one to fly. <laughs> and they would put warnings on that for the parents, you know. Nowhere in my whole train of thought did I ever think that my son was going to Sneak out at night while I was sleeping and become some cape crusader of the city. No, nowhere in my train of, of, of thought that I ever crossed my mind that he was going to get up one day and just, he's going he's to put this on and he's going to have protection as he goes out and fights crime. But the warning was there because some folks probably did try to jump out the window and fly. There's a, a warning for a reason and we have warnings for that specific reason. Just like the warning inside of the cape and on the inside of that mask, we have a warning for us as well. And you know what that warning siren is for us? The warning is the Word of God, and the warning is the Spirit of God that dwells within those that call Him Lord. Because you might be watching television one day, or you might be listening to, to some preaching or some teaching, and one day you hear something, you just know that it's just not right. You can't put your finger on it, you don't know what it is. You think to yourself, Lord, what is it? I, there's something about that. And so you go home, you pray, you search the scriptures, and you find out that he, was, or, he or she was teaching falsely. The Spirit of the Lord does that. It's, it's the red flag. It's our warning system, if you will. If we are led by the Spirit of God, as we find his ways and promises in the scripture, there are those red flags that come up for us, especially when we hear something that is contrary to the Word of God. Anytime you hear something that is contrary to the scriptures, then it is false. And that one is a false teacher. Especially when it comes to the person of Jesus Christ. Especially that and salvation itself. You might go home, you might pray about it, and the Lord reveals this to you through the reading of the word and through the spirit of the Lord that is working in your life and in your heart and in your mind. If anyone proclaims another gospel, whether it be an angel or someone that you might, might think that has the most magnificent smile that you have ever seen, no matter who they are, if they preach something other than Christ, buried, beaten, crucified, rose again, and they make an atonement for sin, then they are preaching a false gospel. It doesn't matter. 
what they look like or what kind of personality they have, if they preach in another Jesus, they are indeed false. They try to strip Jesus of his divinity. Or on this occasion today that we're looking at in 1 John, they try to strip him of his humanity. They try to strip that Jesus was really a man. And this is exactly the crowd that John is writing to. As we read this in, in our week's reading, he is writing to that crowd who tried to say that Jesus was no more than a ghost. No more than an illusion. So you might say, well, yeah, an illusion is just that. It has the appearance of being real. But when you look at it, it, it looks like it's exactly real. And so this is the crowd that he was writing against. They said that Jesus come on as some type of ghost. He, wasn't, he, he was uh, an illusionary. It seems kind of ridiculous for us to say that today. That that's exactly the background that John was writing against. We don't try to preach Jesus Christ to a world today and try to make Jesus more likable or more palatable. We don't have to do that. We don't have to take Jesus and make him more friendly. We don't have to take Jesus and make him more spectacular to the world. He's, a, he's spectacular on his own. We don't have to make him more palatable to the world because indeed if Christ is preached and the Spirit of the Lord is moving and drawing folks, then it is an offense to some. They don't like it. We're not trying to make Jesus more palatable for society or to be politically correct. Sin is sin. And the fact is that God has the right right now to wipe every single one of us off the face of the earth. He has the right and would be justified in doing that. But his mercy and his merciful nature, his merciful nature is seen in the very fact that he does not wipe us off the face of the earth. See, here's a point I'm trying to make is that Jesus, the son, the second person in the triune Godhead, humbled himself, took on flesh, took on flesh and dwelt among us. There is no degrading the aspect that, that Jesus came to earth. He put on flesh. There is no detouring this fact. There is no stripping Jesus of his, of his person or his nature. The fact is that he humbled himself and put on flesh and dwelt among us to die on the old rugged cross, to defeat death, hell, sin, and the grave, and to rise again, and to make intercessions for us. No matter how one might try to degrade Christ, one might try. Jesus Christ is indeed God and is man. Let's look and see what John wrote in his warning labels to us. Just like the warning labels that was on that mask or the cape or any other aspect of life that says, do not do this, do not enter here, beware, watch out. So it is that John give us some warning labels. Children, beware of false teachers. Children, beware of false teachers. Begin in verse 18. He says this, using a term of endearment again. He says, little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard the Antichrist shall come, even now are many Antichrist. Whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For they had been of us, uh, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they, they were not all of us. And then verse 20 says, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. And I have not written it to you because you know, you know, not know the truth, but because you know it. You know the truth, and that no lie is of the truth. Would you bow with me and pray? Father, thank you this morning for the reading of the word. We do so humbly ask you that you would invade our hearts and minds, change us, redirect our path, Father, to be more uh, Christ-centered. Help us, Father, to reflect on the person and the nature of Jesus. Help us to build that knowledge, not only in the head, but in the heart. Help us, Father, this morning to see Christ and all his magnificence as he has been revealed to us in the scripture. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Beware of false teachers. Verse 18, John takes the reader on what we call another apostolic journey. He is at this point flexing his apostolic muscles. He isn't so much like Paul that says, I, Paul, an apostle called by the Lord Jesus Christ. I am an apostle. I've been called by him. John uses a term of endearment and says, little children. 
almost like a spiritual father figure. Little children. So what does one do in the last hour? It is the last hour. What does one do in the last hour? You know, when we uh, signed on the dotted line last Monday, what did we begin to do? We signed on the line for our house. What did we begin to do? We begin to prepare to move. When someone says the Lord Jesus is coming back, as he did here in John's uh, the letter here, what happened? Begin to prepare. You begin to look. You begin to listen. You begin to prepare. And not only that, you begin to tell others around you that this is the last hour. The last time. You prepare. You look. You listen. The warning is that many antichrists are coming. Many antichrists are coming, and John is explaining to them that the last hour is come upon them. And so we might say that Jesus came onto the world scene at the incarnation. He was born in a manger. And as Jesus was born in a manger, the journey to Calvary began. And so we might say that the last hour was from Calvary to the resurrection as Jesus invaded sin, defeated sin, and death ultimately it makes intercessions for us that it is the last hour. We can say it is the last hour now. We could have said it was the last hour then. And 2,000 years from, from now, if Jesus Christ had not come, we can say it is still the last hour. The coming of Christ is imminent. It can come at any time. He can come at any time. It is the last hour. But see, John is writing the last hour is, as an indication that there are antichrists on the scene. This is our flags for us. This is the warning sign, is that there are many that come in the name of Jesus and they just are not of uh, the same teaching. They teach falsely. They taught that Jesus was a spirit and tried to separate his humanity from his divinity. This is the false teaching that John is writing against. And this is what made them antichrist. It is to alert the leader that there might be one... There might be one in the superlative that is antichrist. One person coming on the scene, but then there is also many, many antichrists. But this same spirit of antichrist is at work in the world today. And if you don't believe it's in the world today, you just watch the news for a little while. Just read your paper for a little while. Proclaim the name of Jesus amongst the public square and then find out if John was right. The spirit of antichrist in the world today. There are four times that John uses the word antichrist. It's also found in 2 John as well. This is how you are to know that this is the last hour. There are false prophets and antichrists that preach another Jesus. And Paul even said that if they preach another Jesus or another gospel, he says, let them be accursed. So John is given the warning label because there were some that mingled among them. Some that come in among them. And he says that they were, they were of us. They gathered with us, but they were not of us. There is what we might say today, just like back then, some folks that might have partaken in church fellowship. They may have gone to all the dinners. They may have even lended a helping hand in something in the church. They may have even rose up and, and, and showed an exemplary attitude towards something in the church and all the endeavors, and they helped out all they can. But then, here in the gospel, they have gone their way. Something about them walking away from the faith, if you will. And we'll talk a little bit more about the walking away uh, from the faith. These were people who no doubt sat under one of the, quote-unquote, father's teachings. He goes through children, he goes through fathers, he goes through young men. This is no doubt some folks who have sat under the father's teachings. They have heard the gospel... They rejected the centrality of Jesus Christ to that gospel and his nature, and then they departed. But he says they, were, they, they fellowshiped among us, but now they have, they have left. And this is similar to someone today who would say that they were a Christian. You ever heard somebody say this? They used to be a Christian. Really? They used to be saved. Really? What does John say? He said that they might have been among us, but they were not of us. Oh, they walked away. Well, guess what? If they walked away and truly walked away, then that means that Jesus never had them. And he, they were never in Christ. They might have been among us, but they were not of us. It just shows that their true fruit, the true fruit here. And John is not trying to set up an, an us versus them. He, his central point is that there are some sound doctrines and some sound teaching here that one must adhere to. And when that is not adhered to, the Antichrists are revealed and these red flags come up. Those warning signs uh, come up. See, if one is truly in Christ, they will not leave him. 
they will not get but so far until the Lord begins to call them back. And chances are if they don't come back and they keep on going on, they keep on in disobedience, chances are they are not even in Christ. And this is the kind of crowd that John was writing. They were mingled in with this church here. They heard the word of the Lord. They even were active. But when the rubber meet the road, they left. They left the faith for whatever reason. They did not cling to the Lord Jesus. See, it's not a scare tactic if you think that one has lost their way. You might say to yourself, well, well, preacher, maybe they're in the transitional stage. Maybe they're disobe disobeying and they're, and they're walking that way to really say, but they're in disobedience. And you would say to yourself, well, well, how about those folks? And see, I don't know. They might be in a transitional period of, of coming back and they're just being really disobedient. I could say that if you're uh, disobedient to a point and you are in Christ, I think that, that the Lord would just take on down and just take you out of this world. Take you out of this world so you would have at least a reward of salvation. And you might say, well, that sounds like a scare tactic. If you said to someone, if you keep on in disobedience and keep on going on the way you're going, the Lord will take you out so that you would be saved just so as by fire. That's not a scare tactic. That's the grace of God. That is God's grace. He could let you go and run all into hell. And he would be justified in doing it. He could let you go. But because of his good nature, because of his good nature, he calls those that are in him. David Hunt in the Berean call, he states that there are six biblical marks of a false prophet. We would say just the same thing, false teachers. The signs and wonders, they led those astray after false gods. We can see this in Deuteronomy. The prophecies don't come to pass. And Deuteronomy says, if it does not come to pass, you do not fear that prophet. They contradict God's word. If, a, a, if a person stands up and contradicts the word of God, then they are teaching falsely. They bear bad fruit, or I would say they don't bear fruit. All men speak well of them, meaning if we look in Luke 6, there were those that were on the scene that might have even been religious leaders that said, you know what, everything's going to be okay. We're fathers of Abraham. Everything's going to be okay. God is not going to come in and, and kill and, and destroy his own people. We're, we're secure. They speak, all men speak well of them. And I will tell you this, on this point here, if one does preach the gospel and preach Jesus and preach him fervently in this world, this point here, people will not, all men will not speak well of you. Just an association with Jesus Christ, men will hate you because they hate him. They deny that Jesus, here's the point that John is really getting at. They deny that Jesus, the one and only Christ, has come once and for all in the flesh. Now see in verses 20 and 21, the scriptures make it very clear who Jesus is. And anyone that deviates from this, as this crowd did here, is teaching falsely. Now see, this has a more evangelistic means for us and a missional because it, it, it should elicit within us more desire and hunger to know who Jesus is biblically. Why? Because if we know who Jesus is in the scriptures and know him and, and are able to say, yeah, he was indeed God and he is indeed uh, was in, in human flesh, we can articulate that well and maybe that would lead someone to Christ. It should elicit within us of Christ quite well. It should make us study. I was thinking about this in between Sunday school. I said, you know what? Thinking about this should make someone want to go to Sunday school to learn the scripture, to learn who Jesus really is, to learn the doctrines of the faith, and to really begin to build core, uh, quintessential uh, elements of, uh, of the doctrine of faith in your life, the Christian doctrine. The Holy Spirit gives us the understanding and discernment. It is the Spirit of the Lord that gives us the truth of who Jesus is. It is the Spirit of the Lord that reveals to you that you are sin and that you are opposed to a good and holy God. But see, the knowledge here is not just the head knowledge that one might see. This crowd here thought that they had some special elite knowledge to know who Jesus was. But see, here's the thing. You can fill your mind up. There's atheists that fill their mind up with who Jesus is. You can fill your mind up with who Jesus is. You can know the book from front to back. You can know Genesis all the way through Revelation and be able to recite it. But if you do not have the knowledge relationally of who Jesus is, you are lost. Knowledge is not merely intellectual. There is an element of knowing God personally. And I think John here is going to pick up on both of these points. 
Children, beware of those that try to diminish Christ. And this is the crowd we just got done talking about on the heels of the first point. Beware of those who try to undermine Jesus. So I, I kind of shriek, and I'll bring this up every now and then. I try to sh- sh- I, I shriek when I see someone wearing one of these shirts that says that has a Jesus and doing like this, and it says Jesus is my homie, a homeboy on it. I kind of shriek at that. To, to me, that just says you don't really understand the nature of who Jesus is. He is the creator of the universe, and we're going to put him on the shirt like he's our homeboy or something. There is a point where we need to understand who Jesus is and some reverence that follows. Children, beware for those that try to diminish Christ or put Christ underfoot. Who is the liar but he that denieth that Jesus is Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning, that if which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you shall continue in the Son, abiding in the Son and in the Father. Verse 25 in this point finishes up for us. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. It is so good to know that my salvation does not rest in myself. I cannot keep myself. I'm so thankful that God has supplied a way to keep me. If my salvation was contingent on me keeping it, I would have been lost a long time ago. I think, I'm so thankful that the Lord has me. And if we are in Him and He is in us, then He has kept us. And I am so rested in this fact that we might get down the road a little bit in disobedience. But He has me. And He'll call me back. He'll call me back into being a strong disciple for Him, Lord willing. He'll call me back to getting on my knees and praying more. He'll call me back to getting in His Word more and more. Here is the promise unto us that He has engrafted in us eternal life. Because He has invested in that, He has given us eternal life. That We are in Him and He is in us. Verse 22, the one that denies Jesus is a liar. He not only denies outwardly, but he also changes Jesus into some other person that Jesus is not. He tries to uh, mold and shift and morph uh, Jesus' nature into something that the Scriptures uh, do not depict. He tries to take, take to take the true nature of Jesus and distort it. John is writing to a group of what we would call Gnostics. They knew that they thought that they had an idea of this elite knowledge about Jesus. He's writing to this group who had tried to strip Jesus of his humanity. Not only that, those that deny that Jesus... ...in them... Seems kind of harsh, but the reality of the Scripture is just that. God's Word is that reality. One can understand Antichrist as one that comes into place. Anti can mean one that comes into place of. We might assume, we might be more recognizable if we say Antichrist is one against Christ. But both of those meanings can be the same. There is one that comes against and that tries to take the place. And so there by default... Anti can mean both of those things, taking the place of Christ and also being against. When we think about all the antichrists in the world, we can see those. We can see people who come all down through the ages and try to change the image of Jesus into some, someone that he is not. See, John's focus here is not on one individual, but on many. Many that try to substitute and say that Jesus is his nature and diminish his nature and strip him of his divinity or strip him of even of his flesh. And here's the thing, if that Jesus died on the, on the cross and was crucified and rose again and he was some phantom or ghost, then who was it that died upon that cross? It was it an illusion that of, of an illusionary Jesus. No, Jesus put on, the Son put on flesh. He put on humanity to die for our sake. So he, could, he suffered. And died. Think about that. Put on humanity. Suffered and died. So we would not diminish the divinity of Jesus in any way. Nor would we diminish the fleshly aspect of the risen Lord. 1 Timothy 4 says this. Now the Spirit speaketh expressingly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 
And John is going to go back to this point in verse 24 about the person of Jesus Christ. Rethinking or redirecting or reiterating 1 John 1 1. Once again, what we have, this is so important for us to get this book. That which we have touched, that we have held, that we have seen, which we have heard, which we have ate with, which we had fish with, we had breakfast with, we touched, we walked with, we heard, we prayed with, we cried with, we hugged with. This same Jesus, the real man, and yet God as well, redirected them back to 1 John, the very beginning of his letter, and also in, his, in, the, in the gospel that bears his name, the gospel according to John. In the beginning was the word. And that same word in verse 14 dwelt among us. He tabernacled among men. So John is reverting us back to that verse, back to those previous writings. Again, if Christ has got a hold of you, and you of him, you will not fall away. You will not fall away. Now, you might trip and stumble, and that's going to be, that's going to happen. You might trip and stumble in this Christian walk, and that's going to happen. But it is so reassuring to know that when we do, the Father will pick us up and forgive us. And the thing is, is that we'll, we'll want to repent. See, this is exactly the point that John is making in verse 25. The promise is that if you know him, you really know him in a relational way, and not just the head knowledge, filling our minds with the thing of God are good, but we worship God that way. Jesus said so himself. We worship, we worship God with all that we do, everything, including what we put in our mind, fill our things with the things of God, and those things are good if you fill your minds with the things of God. But it's more than just head knowledge. It's also knowing him in a relational way. And if, those, if you know him in that way, you will not fall away. You will not be lost. Imagine this. An eight-year-old boy comes up and he wants to accept Jesus Christ. He, he says, I want to be saved, preacher. I, I want to come up. I want to be saved. And so the preacher sits with him and, you know, he sits down and he says, well, why do you need to be saved? And so this young little eight-year-old, he understands the gospel. And the preacher looks back and he says, well, you know what? I think you understand the gospel better than some adults do. And so he's sitting there canceling this eight-year-old and the eight-year-old, this, this, little, this little fella. He says, you know what? I want to be saved. I, I know I'm a sinner. And those are key, that's very important. When a, when a child says, I know I'm a sinner, you know, then, then that's very reassuring when you're counseling. But think about this. Do you ever think that that little child, as he comes down at eight years old, is going to be able to tell you the, in fullness and full explanation the nature of Jesus Christ? Do you think that little child is going to be able to pull you back, pull you to the side and say, here's, what I, here's how I see the triune Godhead, preacher, and begin to explain to you that. Here's how I understand the virgin birth. Do you think he's going to understand and be able to articulate to you with that? Eight years old, he probably don't even know what that means yet. Do you think that he's going to be able to articulate in a tangible way the doctrines, the core doctrines of the faith? No, he's not. Probably not. But an indication... Here's the, here's the point I'm making. The indication that they are born of the Spirit of God. They might not know it all. They might not be able to understand it then. They know that they are a sinner. They know that sin is brutal. They know that sin is ugly. They know that if they die, they're going to hell. Here's, here's, here's the child's thinking. If one is really born into the Spirit of God and God got a hold of them, over time... The Spirit of the Lord will reveal the truth, who Jesus is. He will reveal who the Spirit of the Lord is. He will reveal the core doctrines of the faith. This is how you know that that child is in Christ. This is how you know that they are indeed born again. They are of us and they are indeed among us as well because you understand the true nature of Jesus Christ as the Spirit of the Lord and as you couple that with the reading of the Scripture, reveal who Jesus is. It's an indicator that you are in Christ. It's an indicator that you know him. Children, beware of those that will try and steal your confidence. We have confidence in the Lord Jesus this morning. We might not be able, I would not say to exalt ourselves to some, uh, some monstrous uh, idol and say, look, I am this spiritual father. Look at me, bow to me. We won't have that type of boldness or that type of pride. But we can have confidence we can be humbled in Jesus, and we can also have confidence. We can have confidence of, of who he is and what he has done. John writes this. He says, These things I have written unto you concerning them that seduce you. 
There are those that will try to draw you away from the true person of Jesus Christ. Today we live in a philosophical age of all type of worldviews, all type of ideas to begin to seduce, especially the young folks, away from the truth of God's Word. If you don't believe me, talk to, talk to the youth for a while. And see what kind of ideas are circulating in, in the schools. And see what kind of ideas are circulating in the colleges. There's a man down right there at, at uh, UNC. Agnostic. Teaches New Testament. Imagine. And his goal and his purpose is to draw folks, young, uh, young impressionable minds straight out of church and, and, and pull them away from that. If you don't think that this world is full of this seducing spirits, then we have got our heads in the sand. That's why it's so important for us to come beside our young folks and, and build core biblical doctrine. Not only build that doctrine, but to show them how to live it out in our society. But the anointing which you have received, it abides in you. You do not need that any man should teach you. Now, John is not saying that you don't need a preacher or a teacher. He is essentially the one that holds the truth is essentially not man. It is God. You're not learning from man himself. You're learning from God. And you do not need that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence. And not be ashamed before him at his coming. Can you imagine uh, expecting a Jesus who has been stripped of his divinity, has been stripped of his, his humanity. Imagine waiting a Jesus that, has, that did not triumph over death in the grave. Imagine trying to wait for that Jesus to return. We can have confidence because the Lord rose from the dead. We can have confidence because he defeated death. We can have confidence in the Lord Jesus because he walked out of the empty tomb. If you know that he is righteous, he says, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. You will not deviate. As a matter of fact, this is going to go back to those that keep his commandments. Those that keep the commandments of God, we know that's an indication that they are in Christ Jesus. And we can have that kind of confidence because it is not our righteousness that keeps us. It is the righteousness of Jesus. It is not our righteousness that calls us back into Him. It is His righteousness that calls us back. I think of a friend of mine who wrote, who wrote a song. And it really does express the person of Jesus Christ. And I'll read just a few, few lyrics. This fellow's name is Matt. And he wrote, he wrote these words. The, word is called, the, the song is called, I Am. He said, I am the trusting child whose simple faith is ever sure. I am the parent's love, unchanging, unconditional, and pure. I am the loyal friend whose heart will never let you down. I am the hand that pulls you back into the boat before you drown. I am the thunder and the glory and the blinding light. I am the still, small voice that tells you what is wrong and what is right. I am the sacrificial lamb, a guilty world reviled. I am the father ever waiting for his lost and wayward child. It's so good to have a heavenly father that has vested in our lives to the point where he calls us to himself. We can know him. The spirit of the Lord enables us to know him and the truth of God's word and even those that are against the scripture. Those who teach a false Jesus. We have the spirit of the Lord. That sends up those red flags for us. And says there's just something not right about, about that. Would you bow with me and pray this morning? Father thank you for our time this morning in the word of God. I ask you God that you would be with us. As we begin to close out the service in Reflect on, what, on the word that you have, you have given us today. I ask you, God, that you would use this, just a few words that I've tried to spit and sputter out, God, to, to, to attach to our hearts and minds and lives today. We thank you, God, that you have, you have called us to yourself and that you correct us by your spirit and you enlighten our mind, you illumine our mind with the spirit and the word of God. You bring it alive so we can know you in a relational way, in a personal way. 
Father, we ask if there's one here today that doesn't know you in that personal way, that they don't, they don't know you as their Savior. They might know some things about you. They might know some good things about you, Lord Jesus, but they just don't know you personally. They, they haven't realized that sin has kept them from you. We ask you, Father, that, that the Spirit of the Lord will begin to draw that person into yourself. One here might be struggling with some things on their hearts and minds. God, we just ask you that you would help them to find closure today. Help them to have rest in the Lord Jesus. We pray these things in Christ's holy name.